coming up on Theater Talk. When you hear Gershwin, you're hearing New York in the early 20s, you're hearing Paris in the, in the 20s. You're hearing what this man has extraordinary openness to all music. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Michael, An American in Paris is coming to Broadway as a stage musical. Yes, and it so happens I went to Paris in December, Susan. So you did. Where I saw it trying out at the, uh, what do they call it, the Théâtre du Châtelet, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. That's right. Uh, and it is an, a stage adaptation of the famous, wonderful uh, George Gershwin movie, uh, opening at the Palace Theater very soon. And we are delighted to have as our guest to discuss all things Gershwin and an American Paris, our good friend, the theater historian Robert Kimball, uh, sort of the, the expert, I guess, on, uh, on the Gershwins, both George and Ira, with a wonderful book he wrote called The Gershwins. A little old, this book. Could, could, could be updated, perhaps, Robert? Oh, we can keep working on it. There's that, nothing no, you can't work on and make a little better. <laughs> it's fabulous. They should reprint it. And the man who has kept the music <laughs> fresh for us all. <laughs> Rob Fisher, uh, famous, of course, for creating the, the fantastic Encore series at City Center, and he's overseen all the music in An American Paris. Gentlemen, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Merci. <laughs> you were in Paris, too. <laughs> he, he's definitely come you back, know, I, though. It, uh, Robert, take us back, if you will, and what's going on in George Gershwin's life when he decides to write this ballet originally, American in Paris. Well, it's like a symphonic piece, wasn't it? Uh, not a symphonic Well, piece, it, it could have been a ballet. I mean, and I know there were a lot of people approaching him to write a ballet, but it ended up being a tone poem. Mm -hmm. And Diaghilev, who often wanted to work with an American and then decided not to, uh, considered it. But then it, it became a tone poem, and, and uh, it's now a ballet although it was a ballet for the movie, or at least an extensive part of it was a ballet. For but was Gershwin was living in Paris when he wrote it? Isn't that the story? He was like the Bristol Hotel or the Pizza Hotel? That's right. No, you're right. He was there for a while. He was there on a couple of visits. A memorable visit of 1928, 26 when he started working on it. And it was a special part of his life, and it's an amazing piece, a wonderful, great piece. Can I chime in? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Because he was... At that time, I know he was really fascinated with all things impressionistic, both painting and music. Mm. And on that 26th trip, he collected every piece of music Debussy had written. Mm. He was trying to spend time with Ravel and Lacis. He was fascinated by that. And he, I, he wrote about the piece that he was trying to do. It's not completely programmatic, but he was trying to indicate someone roaming through the streets of Paris. Mm -hmm. He collected those famous taxi horns while on that trip That's to right. Paris. Right. And he was just trying to give, make you feel that along with this homesickness for America mm. that pops up in the piece. So he, there were specific things he was trying to accomplish. And he, he wrote about it as if he could imagine it danced early on, but it wasn't written to be danced. But oh, so but was, he, it, he had the idea his, of a ballet in his Well, he had the mind. idea that it could be used in that way. Right. And why a uh, symphonic piece, tone, tone poem, you say, uh, any ever uh, uh, did he ever think, you know, uh, my brother Ira should come in here and we should add some lyric to this? I mean, in American Paris, Ira could write a snappy lyric to that. Was that ever in the cards? Not really, although Ira did write a, a, a lyric for, par, for one small part of the score. It became but that like was an afterthought, blues. yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't that long after, because in the show Showgirl in 1929, the piece was uh, used as a ballet for the Albertina Rash dancers, oh. mm. and so it had a, a dance life briefly. It wasn't the full piece at that time. Mm. But there were, there, people thought, this is an amazing piece. What are we going to do with it? And so Ira took her hand out, and everybody looked at it and said, this is just great. There's a wonderful recording of George playing it on the piano, which you can get now. And, oh, and, wow. and it works so beautifully with this solo performance by George Gershwin back in, in the, I guess they recorded it soon after. Yeah. But now it was completely reinvented in 1951 for the movie after World War II, <laughs> where a whole new nostalgia about Paris had been developed. And we're taking the nostalgia because by 1951 it had become 
sort of MGM Technicolor nostalgia yeah. of yes. World War yes. II, yes. Um, the producers and Craig Lucas, our writer, and Christopher Wheeldon decided, let's move it back closer to the end of the war mm -hmm. and have a little more realistic idea of both the joy of the newfound freedom and the angst of what we've been through mm. to play against each other. So it's, it's a bigger color palette for us this time. Yeah, no, and this, uh, this production I was struck by the uh, sort of the, the hints at uh, collaborators and collaboration mm -hmm. and, you know, France itself is going to have to make peace somehow with its, That's right. its divided uh, uh, yes. history and divided loyalties in the war. It's part of the plot. People protecting and hiding Jews because mm -hmm. they felt compelled to out of a moral sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what, Rob, how, are you improving on Gershwin's music here as the There's music supervisor? No <laughs> way. What exactly? I, I, I just can't one. quite figure. I mean, you're an incredibly talented conductor. He, all that. We call him the great it's, improver. It's Gershwin. Yeah, I mean, right. what, are you, what are you doing to Gershwin? <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> let's see, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I'm trying to like, never he... betray him. It's like, oh, it's, it's the things I'm trying, I'm trying to like, is George and Ira, are you okay with this? Are you okay with us doing oh. the verse before the chorus or the chorus before oh, the verse? Yeah. If I add a four bar extension here, using your entire vocabulary, oh. are you okay? <laughs> For the ballets in particular, there was a lot of editing to do. We couldn't do the entire, Fair. we're not doing the entire concerto in F. We're not <laughs> doing the, even the entire, we're the biggest, we're doing a majority of An American in Paris. Mm -hmm. and we're doing, our edit of it is closer to George's piece than the edit in the movie yes. in terms of the sequence of events and how much music is there. Are you having this sequence like in the movie where it's, it becomes dreamlike ballet, running the whole American in Paris, I guess you call a suite, within the framework of the whole... It, it is it's a dreamlike ballet. I mean, you. what's an impression just walking in off the street? Because it is, well, it, it's, it's, resol it's moving the story forward and resolving things yes, more yes. than in the, ba in the movie. Yes. But it's that same idea that it is, it's a non-reality. The reality changes. Yeah, the yeah. reality but changes. But it, it doesn't alter the plot. I mean, it's really... Well, I mean, to me, it's 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 the romance. It's yes. the yeah. people falling in love. In this case, not just singing a song, I love you, I love you, That's I love right. you, but they dance a song right. of love that is in sure. Paris. And we also added the thread of the character Adam is composing. His whole journey through mm -hmm. the piece is composing this. Was this so the Oscar Levant character? Yes, yeah. that character. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's the culmination of his composition. It's the culmination of romances. It's, a col you know, everything... And it's fantastic, to, as you say, to see it dance, a, a culmination mm -hmm. danced rather than sung. Right, right. Now, I was, one of the challenges... You look I like thought, you're going to like it. I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm going to like it. Well, I was, one of the challenges I thought with it, uh, which I, I think was pretty well on its way to, to being solved, uh, was this combination of ballet, because mm -hmm. Christopher Wilden comes from the ballet world, yes. and this music is meant, you know, you can't tap dance to an American in Paris. But the other hand, this is also an old-fashioned musical comedy, too, and you have a lot of old-fashioned musical comedy elements in it. Yes. So you have the classical ballet, modern ballet, going through it, but then you turn and you do, I'll build a stairway to paradise, and which you is an old-fashioned showstopper. Yes. Exactly. But that could have been... Did you have any issues or problems with that being a slightly uneasy mix of two idioms? Very little, mm. um, but but it goes back to George, mm. because George, he's... he did it. He did it. He yes. did the whole spectrum for us. So I think by honoring his spectrum, we're all set to do all those things. And Robert, didn't George say that he he never wanted to follow somebody else's tradition or form, but that he always wanted to be making new forms sure. for himself? Sure. He was listening to the sounds of his time. When you, you hear Gershwin, you're hearing... New York in the early 20s, you're hearing Paris in the, in the 20s, you're hearing what this man has extraordinary openness to all music. He was a phenomenally open person. He loved all music. He loved Alban Berg. <laughs> he loved people who were very different. Arnold Schoenberg was his close friend. <laughs> they played tennis together. When he was in Paris, he said his favorite composers were Bach, Stravinsky, now I've forgotten the third, but it's yeah. <laughs> people don't think about how closely tied he was to classical That's right. music. Right, right. And right. I feel like a new generation of scholars is going to go back and figure this out that have kind of dismissed him as less legitimate than other right, American so composers. Yeah. And of course, it's very interesting that he was really the first generation that he could be listening to all these recordings uh, of, of such a wide That's variety right. of music mm -hmm. that. 
that, that hadn't been possible right. previously. And there was music going up in Harlem that was nobody had been able to listen to until the 1920s. That's right. yeah. A question yeah. for you. Um, this is a, a spec speculative question, but I was thinking, you know, Jerome Robbins was the great director choreographer of Broadway musicals. But then he moved into the ballet and he really never went back. Mm -hmm. Was Gershwin drifting away from the theater at no. the end of his life into serious music? Do you think that's the he area? He never he drifted away. He enhanced all of it. He always considered doing any kind of project. He was a man who made it possible for others to do it, like Leonard Bernstein and mm -hmm. others. He was open to all kinds of music. He didn't believe in these barriers or these walls. Mm -hmm. And I and think of it as he expanded. He just kept expanding. Right. Okay, I'll do movies now. Okay, I'll do an opera now. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like he's going to leave anything behind. No. He's just going to add it to the plate. He was working at the very beginning of a new musical satire with Kaufman and Hart. Oh. If he'd come back, he probably would have worked on that. Do we know anything about that? What the no, plot was? No, no. They didn't get any, very far. Any songs? No, or? we have no songs. No material anywhere in no, all the archives? Just a few brief discussions or telegrams. He's coming back. Mm -hmm. And he would work with them because, you know, he was very fond of them and they were really fond of him. You could also think he would have, had he lived, he would have been part of what Roger and Hammerstein did with inventing the uh, dramatic musical. I don't think so. You don't, you don't think so? Why? I do not. I think he would have led more to what On the Town is like as a musical. He would have been about celebrating the present and the city. He was not going to go back into the past of some mythical, romantic past. No, he would have been closer to Leonard <laughs> Bernstein. Uh, just a minute or so left. Can I ask you, uh, your favorite, Rob Fisher, your favorite Gershwin tune? Mm. I know so it's not good one. with favorites of any kind. <laughs> I mean, as one, long as I could have another favorite in about five minutes. Yes. Absolutely. But if you pick one to just sort of indicate, oh, as, as a musician yourself, what you admire oh, about boy. it. What you admire about it. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm going to pick soon for no good That's reason. That's exactly what I was thinking. Soon. Oh, my God. How does, I, was th I was thinking soon. How does soon. soon go? Soon, my lovely love, till we end it soon. It's singing. It's brilliant. both the shape of the melody, which mm. is, it's not like all his shapes. It's not a rhythmic shape. It's a really windy, curvy, mm. girly shape almost. That's interesting. But these... And also very sexy harmonic changes underneath it that go in an unexpected way but resolve in the most satisfying mm. ways. Mm. Mm. And yours, Robert? You've thought about this, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> these guys a I'll lot. I'll have another one in a minute <clears throat> if All you right. want. Well, for most of my life, my favorite Gershwin song was They Can't Take That Away From Me. Yes. I'm not sure it still is, but it's up there. Yeah, why? The evocation of the past, of the whole sense of a relationship, over, but the wonderful mixed feelings you have about it, the good, the bad, everything. It's just such a, to me, such a great song. And it was used so very little in the movie, Shall We Dance, mm. one chorus. And that's it. Sending it to Pierre in Hoboken. That was it. And they, it could, they could have done much more with that. But song. so memorable. Oh, no, yes, you, can, you picture them together. You send you another quick one? No. Yes. Oh, I just always, yes. I was just thinking about beginner's luck. Yeah. yeah, I well, love Beginner's Luck, too. Because it's such, when George and Ira collaborate the best, it can be that slight sadness and yearning and mm. unsatisfactoriness with jubilation, like the, just like How, how does that. Beginner's Luck go? I've got Beginner's Luck. You need to hear the harmony of it, because the harmony You won't get them from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the piano? You <laughs> He's next time, next time I'll have a he can do I it. I like Wonderful. You like some oh, I like that. Oh, you know, yeah. I like that. It's so reliable. <laughs> it is. It is. But I'll tell you why I like that. Uh, it, because as a kid, I saw my one and only. I'll, I'll never forget Tommy Toon mm. and Twiggy. I think they tap danced in the sand or on yeah, in yeah, the that's water. Right. Yeah, that um, little thing of water. That there. little thing of water. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. And I thought, now that's a great song, great lyric that lends itself to that kind of great Tommy Toon inventiveness and interpretation. Well, you know, Michael Feinstein used to go over to Ira's room and they had a little piano. And he'd say, Ira, I'm now going to play a medley of your favorites. And he would proceed to play things like Hot Hindu and <laughs> other notable Gershwin stuff. And Ira was going, stop, stop. <laughs> no, no, anything but that. And Michael would go on and be playing something equally obscure. <laughs> All right. Uh, Robert Kimball, the yes. uh, great historian of uh, music and the musical theater. Thank you for being our guest on Theater Talk. A pleasure, guys. And Rob Fisher, who's... Um, uh, Reinventing but staying true to
to the spirit of the Gershwins in an American in Paris. He's one of our great heroes. Oh, no question about that. What he's done for musical theater in our time is so great. Yeah. Well, and that applies to both of you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And I rely on him all the time. Yes. Good God, there's a lot of sucking up going on. Oh, oh yeah. No, no. It's just credit where credit is due. Thanks for being our guest. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Where's, you. When, no one say anything nice about me. I was trying to think yeah, of something. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to spoil her <laughs> reputation. Come I on. Know. The great Josephine Baker's life seems to me to be tailor-made for a Broadway musical, and in fact, there is one in the works. It is based on a biography of Josephine Baker called The Hungry Heart, written by her adopted son and our very good friend, Jean-Claude Baker, who is also the proprietor of Chez Josephine, the wonderful French bistro on 42nd Street. Bonsoir. It's a pleasure to be with you. Her life uh, really is the stuff of, 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 of a Broadway musical, indeed, of, of a great theatrical evening. Um, tell us, if you will, where she came from and how she invented herself as this legendary performer. That's very good. Eva invented, she uh, she reinvented herself yeah. uh, all the time. She was born in St. Louis, um, sorry, in 1906, of a very dark-skinned mother, a white father who was German, and her first name was Frida. F-R-E-D-A, quite a long way from a legendary Josephine Baker. Mm. She grew up in St. Louis. When she was six, seven years of age, her mother used to rent her to a gypsy musician family. Of course, in those days, there were black people. That's where she was. And she used to play the trombone. And she remembered that the trombone was taller than she was. Uh, she left St. Louis uh, when she was 15 years of age. She had been married at 13. Mm. We forgot that, and she forgot him very easily. <laughs> and she left as the protégé protégé, the girlfriend, of Clara Smith, who was a fabulous blues singer. She arrived in Philadelphia, and that's where she married William Baker, and Josephine Baker was born. Mm -hmm. Then she was in Chauffeur Le Long, right. fabulous black musical, Chocolat Dandies, went to Paris in 1925 at the age of 19, mm -hmm. uh, opened at Le Théâtre des champs Élysées uh, with a show called La Revue Nègre on October the 2nd, mm -hmm. and on the 3rd, the first black sex symbol of the last century was born. Josephine Baker, yeah. Absolutely. Do you think she knew what she was doing with her body, with her sexual appeal? Was that what she was using to create uh, the sexy, risque Josephine Baker? Uh, yes and no. In America, contrary to the legend, she had already become very famous. She had been written up by the New York Times, mm -hmm. Variety, and diverse black newspapers like the Amsterdam News, the Chicago Defender, or the Pittsburgh Courier. And she was known as the most famous chorus girl in America. Mm -hmm. She was making $125 on Broadway in 1924 when a white secretary was making $16. Mm -hmm. She arrived in Paris, and suddenly she was the, the French at that time at that fantasy of the naked black girl from Africa coming down from a coconut tree. Excuse me, that was what Europe men wanted, you know? Mm -hmm. And Josephine arrived at the right moment, at the right time. Mm -hmm. That when Picasso, right on there, were celebrating L'Art Negre, mm -hmm. and La Revue Negre arrived, and pop, here was Josephine. Mm -hmm. uh, first, she didn't dance naked with banana, for which she's famous, that will be next year. With La Revue Negre, she danced the Charleston, only with a little African, uh, Sing around, yeah. naked, uh, with, with dreams, and thousands of Josephine were reflected. She wasn't dancing naked in New York, though. She became a sex symbol in Paris. Absolutely, right? because the French said, we need nichon. Excuse me, the translation is, we need tits. Yeah, she, they could be, she could be topless in Paris, <laughs> but not <laughs> in New York. <laughs> and then, and uh, the, she was not the only one. Six girls yeah. from La Revue Neg were topless at the shows. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, uh, we're, we'll run on this show a, a, a clip you have of her at the Olympia in mm -hmm. 1968. And you really see her as a kind of performer that we don't have anymore. I mean, she is a mixture of, I guess, the, the blues, Broadway, vaudeville, 
uh, music hall. She's an amalgam of all of those performing arts of the latter half of the 20th century. Is that, I is that agree with you, but what should not be forgotten is that when she arrived in Paris at 19 years of age, she had indeed learned her trade from that fabulous time of black entertainment. There were a great, of course, discrimination against people of color, but talent had always been recognized. Mm. Black performers would perform in the theater with a colored entrance and a white entrance, but they would bask on the stage in the applause of both black and white audiences. So, so Joyfine Ravine Paris, perfect. And she had a great ability to capture, to catch, to steal, whatever. She the stole man. a lot from oh, people, didn't so she? Every, every act and everything. And when she arrived in Paris, I interviewed two of the chorus girls of the night. They were horrified the way Joséphine embraced the way the French wanted her. She copied the hair of the French men, not of women, men. Mm -hmm. And she went naked and really gave herself on the opening night. Everything went but penetration, excuse me. She was coupled, <laughs> she was coupled with an African dancer, Jo Alex, mm -hmm. and they had a mating dance, yes. like in Africa. So if you had never been in Africa, knew nothing of it. She was fabulous. Half of the theater left screaming that black and jazz would destroy the white civilization, while the rest of the audience, including Cocteau, Picasso, Maurice Ravel, uh, Gertrude Stein, mm -hmm. Crown Josephine, the first black sex symbol of the century. Yeah. What, what drove her? What were her personal demons that drove this poor girl from St. Louis into creating the, this sex symbol of the 20th century? A lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, and she never found peace with her own self. She never recognized her own talent. She was, she would say, a violinist, he has his violin. Mm -hmm. I have nothing, I have only my body. And at the beginning, that's what she taught, the body that only thing she could give. Mm. And of course, she gave it wonderfully, mm -hmm. erotically, and it was never dirty. In the clip that, we, that, that we'll show is uh, from 1968. Yes, at the now, how, how old is Josephine at this point? Uh, she is uh, 65 years of age. 65 years She's old. And why, is she, back and why is she back at the Olympia? What, what's going because on? Because all, all her life she performed. And yeah. right now, thank you for asking, she's back at the Olympia because once again, she's losing Le Milan, which she will lose the next year. Bankruptcy, money. She was always in and out of bankruptcy. And always what's, what's in Le, and out. Le Milan? It's Le Milan, that the chateau, the oh, wonderful so chateau. She's going to lose her house. She bought right. 600 acres, which has a total madness. And where at the end, it was a Disneyland. You would pay to see Josephine Little Girl. The swimming pool was in like Josephine. Uh, it was madness. And 2, we say people would come. she had a number of adopted children there. That come later oh, on. Later, she right. will have, she, at the end, she would have children as the last creation. Uh, 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 so yes, you're not very good She's doing this, this performance. We're going to show the tape. She's 65 years old. And she's bankruptcy with my brother and sister, Le Milan. And she could always go back at the Olympia, where Bruno Cocatrice was happy to put her. So the show was put in two minutes, and here she is. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, and we'll shoot the blues away. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, and we'll see the skies are gray. Now Satan hides away and creating the skies of gray. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, and we'll shoot the blues away. When she first comes out, you think, oh, my God, it's grotesque, and yet you cannot turn away from her. It's absolutely fascinating. She just cast a spell over audiences like that. Huh? What was she like, though, when the show was over with and she took off all the dresses and all the makeup? What was Josephine Baker you knew like? Uh, she would get out, so sometimes if she was in good mood, she would receive uh, people. If she wasn't in good mood, I said, I'm sorry, Maman is very tight. Thank you very much for being here. And then we would go out and eat spaghetti bolognese mm -hmm. with a beer. That was it. That was it. And she, of course, would never pay a penny. There would always be some people who would pay, and we would be 20 people or whatever, and that, that, that was it. And she would go home. She could never sleep. Never, never. Mm -hmm. That was a big problem, which she should have been to a doctor for that. She would nap here two minutes during the day, during the night, and never really have three or four hours sleep. Mm. Was, she, was she lonely? I know she adopted children. She had lots to be around, but did she have a lover? Did she have a man she really cared deeply for? Or was she just not able to connect on that level? No, to she was human bisexual. Yeah. Uh, so she had lover of, of both <laughs> so sex. She, didn't have, that. she oh. didn't have to be lonely. <laughs> well, uh, no, and, but she never loved. I think the great love of her life was Charles de Gaulle. Really? General de Gaulle. Did she have sex with Charles de Gaulle? Yes, she had. Really? Yeah. Did he love her Before too? her, 
that I don't know. Yeah. But for her, the goal represented, you know, she had been abandoned, she had never known her father, of right. course, she had been abused as a child. So uh, the, the main, the goal represented God to her. Mm, interesting. All right, the book is The Hungry Heart, um, the biography of Josephine Baker by Jean-Claude Baker, owner of Chez Josephine, the restaurant that bears her name. Good to see you, Jean-Claude. It's a pleasure always. Thank you. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.